Moving on to physiology and the respiratory system, you probably have already noticed that uh, our lab covered a large amount of physiology. Pulmonary ventilation, you already know this. So ventilating, bringing air in and out. When you bring it in, that's inspiration. When you bring it out, that is expiration. So how does that happen? We actually have already kind of been through this in lab. We have a pressure system is what's helping us bring air into our lungs. So atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, right? And when we inhale and our diaphragm contracts, it flattens. When our diaphragm flattens, instead of being in that dome shape, now our thorax has more volume, right? There's more air. And whenever you increase volume, you decrease pressure. When you do that, increase volume, decrease pressure, this is Boyle's Law, air is going to move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So it's not much of a difference. Maybe we made it 759 millimeters of mercury inside of our chest, but that's still lower than 760. So air is going to follow that 759, going from an area of high pressure to low pressure. The air comes into your chest, into the airway, and fills up all those cute little alveoli uh, with air. When I say we have flattened our diaphragm, increased the volume, so therefore we have decreased the pressure and made it 759, I'm talking about the intrapulmonary pressure, the pressure inside that tissue. When it hits 760, just like the outside uh, atmospheric pressure, the breath stops. Our brain's in charge of that. We have reflexes that put us in, that that are in charge of that. Now, that area in the pleural space is called the intrapleural pressure. Remember, intra is within, so the intranet is a, an internet system only for people in TCC. Uh, the interstate is a passageway between states, so from state to state. It's not intra, it's interstate. So intra, plural pressure, is in that little slit between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, and it's always negative. In other words, it is a vacuum. And that vacuum is what allows the parietal pleura to grab a hold of that visceral pleura and kind of drag it along whenever you take that breath in you expand your chest remember i said in the last powerpoint your ribs go out and a little bit up and that i mentioned that the parietal pleura is kind of clung to the visceral pleura and so surface tension allows it to go too and of course if your visceral pleura goes up and out your lungs are going to expand. You don't ever get excess fluid in this area. You don't ever get um, excess serous production because we have lymphatics passing through there and making sure that it's draining any extra fluid into back into the venous system. But if fluid or air gets into your intrapleural space, the lungs are going to collapse. That's bad. So this is showing that intrapleural negative pressure that creates the vacuum. And in fact, if a knife were to come in here and break it, you could hear it deflate. Everything was absolutely very audible. 
showing the different pressures right here. So when you're done taking a breath, 760, you take a breath and you flatten this diaphragm. So for just a moment, you made it 759. Once it's zeroed out, so 760 and 760, then the breath stops and then you're going to exhale. Ah, there's the knife puncturing the pleural space and you see what happens to this to this lung right here you have this is drawing again like there's this massive space it's not it's they're stuck to each other but it is a potential space that knife has broken that and brought it to the outside world so we have broken the vacuum here and so what happens to this tissue right here is this it just collapses on itself that nice fluffy sponge is now collapsed all those little alveoli are not little sacs anymore they're just flattened like a flattened balloon now look, these are separate right here. So this person's left lung is fine. It's the right lung that collapsed. This is an x-ray of a dog and this is normal. So the heart should be sitting on the sternum um, and the black, just like the outside of this dog, is mostly black, right? Because that's air surrounding the dog. Lungs are mostly air, airs are mostly black. You have things passing through them. So any little white stripes that you see on here. Like this, these little things right here. It's just airways. This is the main bronchus right there. All right. This dog has a pneumothorax air has been introduced into this chest so notice the heart is no longer sitting on the sternum and this is lung lobe completely collapsed it's not full of air anymore it's squished the balloons have been emptied from their air and so now they're more white because there's no the x-rays aren't passing through it anymore they're stopping at the tissues because they're flattened. When a lung collapses, that's called atelectasis. It can be from uh, either what I just showed you, pneumothorax, or sometimes you'll just get, if those bronchioles get um, plugged up, uh, maybe excess mucus or whatever, the lungs will actually collapse on themselves. How do you treat that pneumothorax? Well, you put a chest tube in. Um, when you put that tube in, you actually physically suck the air out. You use something called stopped, stopcock to uh, pull air, and then you turn the stopcock and you make the air go back out into the atmosphere. Turn the stopcock again, pull the air out, turn the stopcock so that the air goes back out into the atmosphere. And you're going to leave that uh, chest tube in until the primary cause is resolved. Again, inspiration and expiration changes pressure and that air can flow. And I've said this in the previous slides and in lab and now i'll say it one more time boyle's law is saying when volume goes up pressure goes down when volume goes down pressure goes up they are inversely proportional then in lab we had that um, dome that you can actually physically see um, watch the video where uh, i'm pulling down on that that quote unquote diaphragm it's a piece of rubber making it go flat and you can watch those lungs balloons expand volume increases pressure decreases 
air is going to move from high pressure to low pressure. It doesn't matter if it's just one uh, millimeter of mercury. It's still a difference. So inspiration is an active process. You work at it. You tell your diaphragm to contract and your diaphragm goes down and flattens out. Your external intercostals are going to contract and cause your ribs to go out and up. So therefore you have increased your thoracic volume. Air is going to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. If you increase your volume, you decrease your pressure. So again, one millimeter of mercury is one millimeter of mercury. When you take that air in and you equalize your intrapulmonary pressure, you made it 760, so your inspiration stops. But then you're going to relax. So when you exhale, that's going to be a passive process. You exhale and you decrease the volume in your chest. So you've increased the pressure in your chest. Now it's 761, so air is going to move from high pressure to low pressure and go back out into the atmosphere. Sometimes I like graphs, but not this one. Okay. When you force yourself to exhale, that is an active process. So like you did in lab, <laughs> when we're doing all those measurements, you force yourself to exhale as much as possible. Then we're using our abdominal obliques. We're using our transversus abdominis. Uh, and you could even be using your internal intercostals. For example, you are going for a run. You're training for some sort of uh, competition. You're at the point now that you're... <gasps> <sighs> you're using the internal intercostals now. So you're really working at it. Other things that make your air move, coughing, sneezing, crying, you can read it at the bottom, um, a lot of them are reflex actions. Some of them are voluntary, but we do actually have respiratory movements that have nothing to do with gas exchange. Okay, so what influences ventilation? What influences the air going in and out? Well, one would be um, if something is going on, you know, you need nice, clear passageways. You need clear hallways so people don't bump each other during COVID or whatever. <laughs> you, you don't want any resistance. So if you've got inflammation or maybe some of those smooth muscles are spasming and tightening the airway, making it a skinny hallway, then it's going to be harder for air to move in and out. I mentioned this one earlier. You must have those type 2 alveolar cells working and making surfactant. If they don't, those little teeny tiny sacs touch each other and they can't break those hydrogen bonds and expand. Gas can't get in there, flatten little balloons, and then you're having a hard time breathing. So surface tension inside the alveoli. And then, of course, something that has scarred or fibrosed the lungs, so they're all thickened and tight, just like the liver. Um, asbestos is well known to do that. That's called compliance. How compliant are your lungs? Are they nice and elastic and expand and collapse, or are they scarred and tough? This just looks horrid. There's clearly something going on with this human being's right uh, superior lung cavity there. He also, did you notice he had a tracheostomy in there? Okay, so these volumes that we did in lab, 
are now done by an electronic device. But, um, and, and they'll be used to measure, you know, how's your respiration going, you know, are you doing your breathing exercises at home, whatever, to help your capacities, to help how much air you bring in. Um, swimmers, mentioned this in lab, are amazing ventilators. They have exercised that chest cavity to be able to get as much air as possible in that chest and hold it for as long as possible. Very, very strong lungs. We don't think about exercising our lungs, but swimmers do. So we'll assess ventilation for people that have some sort of respiratory problem. In lab, we used a spirometer. Remember, there was the wet spirometer and the dry spirometers that I showed you on the video. Okay, so tidal volume is the normal amount of air you usually move in and out, like while you're just sitting there watching Netflix or Hulu or whatever. And it's approximately a half a liter, so 500 mils for everybody, roughly. Um, in lab, we did inspiratory reserve volume. So that is the amount of air that can be inspired forcefully past tidal volume. So when you are gonna go down, you drop something at the bottom of the swimming pool, the Olympic swimming pool, that is however many feet deep, I don't know. But let's say, well, let's just do 15 feet. You are going to not just do your normal inhalation, before you dive down to go get that toy, you're gonna to take a great big breath. That is the amount that you can take in more than a regular tidal volume. That's inspiratory, inspiratory reserve volume. Expiratory reserve volume is how much you can forcibly expel from your lungs. Maybe you're blowing up a balloon, right? So you're gonna, and try and get out as much as possible and be done with blowing up the balloon. Then finally, we have a volume in our chest that never gets moved. It's called the residual volume, and you must have some air in your chest that is uh, keeping those alveoli open, okay? So you've got air inside each and, one, each and every one of those tiny little sacs we do not want them to collapse. So that is your residual volume inside each tiny little sac. And then we did this in lab. So the how much you can take in your inspiratory capacity is your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume. Uh, let's jump down to your vital capacity. Your vital capacity is your 500 mils of tidal volume plus the amount extra you can inhale, plus the amount extra you can exhale. It's the sum of all of those. Your total lung capacity is going to include your reserve volume, but that guy never moves. And then finally, your functional reserve capa residual capacity is that reserve volume plus your expiratory reserve volume. We didn't really get into that in lab. You saw this chart in lab, but not in color. Very pretty to help you see, okay, we gave you this number right here. We gave you tidal volume, roughly 500 mils. And then we had you uh, do an expiratory reserve volume. So how much extra can you blow out? And then we had you do your... Um, your total vital capacity. So take a great big breath in and then measuring as you exhaled as much as you could exhale. So that would be your vital capacity. You couldn't measure the inspiratory reserve volume because that wet spirometer has water so you would in inhale. Plus that's not a really good way to measure the quantity of inhalation, right? Because you're sucking in, you're not putting any pressure on a machine. So the way you tell the difference is you subtract, you take that um, 
vital capacity and you subtract expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and then you have your um, inspiratory reserve volume. So anatomical dead space, we have very little dead space that doesn't do gas exchange inside all those tiny little bronchioles and bronchi. Uh, air is moving back and forth, but we're not exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide in those spaces, right? That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to have a passageway for the air to travel. Um, Alveolar dead space, um, especially if you're a smoker or you have um, COPD or maybe if you've had chronic asthma, some of those alveoli aren't working anymore. So they're collapsed and that would be alveolar dead space. Of course, put those two together, you know what your total dead space is. So non-useful area, surface area there. So what do we do these tests for? Well, I just mentioned them. Obstructive pulmonary disease is when you have increased airway resistance. Maybe the bronchi are constricted or scarred. Um, maybe they're full of snot all the time, but you can't get air in. And what can happen is you have, just like with your sinuses, you have to force your air in but then it can't get back out. So you hyperinflate your lungs. Restrictive disease is you can't get air in. The lungs are fibrosed. So uh, this is usually more at the alveolar level. And um, <clears throat> this would be like a asbestos, tuberculosis or whatever diseases that have completely damaged your alveolar area. So we've done this already. External respiration is between blood and lungs. Internal respiration is at the blood and the tissue. So that is actually more circulatory space is what we're talking about there. But they're both subject to gas laws. So let's go over these. Dalton's law of pressure means that if you have, let's say we have air, right? We've got um, lots of nitrogen in it. We have lots of oxygen in it, um, some hydrogen in it, but whatever. Whatever that 760 millimeters of mercury is, you can take the percentage of the nitrogen plus the percentage of the oxygen plus the percentage of whatever, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and it's going to equal the total percentage, I mean the total of 760. So the partial pressure of each gas is going to total the complete pressure of the gas. Each part is going to total whatever, 760 in the atmosphere. Now, if we have some sort of semi-permeable membrane, and let's say we've got, um, let's do oxygen, it's higher in concentration in the alveoli, lower in concentration in the blood that's passing by, oxygen is going to move from high concentration to low concentration and diffuse through. It acts independently of all the other gases. So oxygen is going to be independent of nitrogen, blah, 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 blah. So, of course, the purpose of the lungs at the alveoli is to get oxygen into the capillaries and get carbon dioxide that's at the capillaries back into the lungs so you can breathe it out. So if you have oxygen in the alveolus at 104 partial pressure, in the capillary 40, which direction is that oxygen going to want to move? It's going to want to move from the alveolus 104 into the blood 40, high pressure to low pressure. Same thing with carbon dioxide. 
partial pressures of carbon dioxide aren't as drastic as that oxygen, but at the alveolus, when you've taken a breath in, not very much carbon dioxide, partial pressure of 40, but that vessel that has just come from all your tissues that needs oxygen and your tissues made carbon dioxide, that partial pressure is 45. Moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration, that carbon dioxide is going to want to move from 45 in the blood into the alveolus, 40, and you're going to blow it out. How does that oxygen get carried? Well, it goes two ways. It loves to be in the red blood cell. That's its favorite, 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 favorite place to be. Your red blood cell is just a sack of hemoglobin. And what is on the inside of these little hemoglobins is iron molecules. Um, the oxygen is going to bind to the iron in the middle of the hemoglobin. You have four chains. And you can see that heme group, group right there with the green right there. That's the iron right there. So that's where the oxygen wants to be. Alpha globulin and beta globulin are proteins. Carbon dioxide, he can bind inside that hemoglobin, but he's going to bind to the protein part the globin part, not the heme part. And that's going to be called carbaminohemoglobin. But carbon dioxide's favorite way to travel is not dissolved in the plasma, not inside that red cell, but rather as bicarbonate in the plasma. So you really should memorize this um, this equation. Carbon dioxide is going to mix with water and become carbonic acid. Remember, carbon dioxide is nonpolar, and you just moved it from your lungs into your blood. Blood is a huge percent water. So how does he how does he go? How does he flow through there if he's nonpolar and your blood is polar? Well, he's going to become carbonic acid. Then inside those red blood cells that are in your blood, we're going to have an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that's going to break it down into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Let me tell you, when you think carbon dioxide, just go ahead and put it in your head, hydrogen ion. Higher carbon dioxide, higher hydrogen ion. So this bicarbonate is the most preferred way for carbon dioxide to float around in your body, in the plasma. Well, Henry's Law means that we're going to move things from a gas state into a liquid state the same however that gas likes to behave. So some gases are more soluble than others. Carbon dioxide, very soluble, easy to move. And so therefore that difference of 45 to 40 still has equal exchange as oxygen because he's a free mover. Um, just like you learned about diffusion, heating things up makes things happen faster. Same thing with gas exchange. And um, if you have a Coke and you leave it, you've opened it and you leave it out on the counter, it's going to be flat faster than if it's in the fridge. Because the reason that that Coke has fizz in it is because we forced carbon dioxide into it. We put it in there. We made the bubbles at the Coke place. Well, when you leave the lid off, you've opened it and you leave the lid off, that carbon dioxide wants out. He wants to go from an area of high pressure to low pressure. And the colder it is, the slower that Coke is going to go flat. Why am I telling you nitrogen is very low solubility at atmospheric pressure? Well, because 
he, it, on earth, our nitrogen doesn't really want to go into our blood unless you change pressures. And I thought the next slide had to do with nitrogen. So I'll just tell you that the bends that divers get, it happens because we're not at atmospheric pressure when you're diving down 100 feet, 150 feet. Well, even 50 feet, right? You're changing the pressure. And so you can actually force nitrogen into your bloodstream because you're usually it's not soluble at 760. It doesn't want to go into your blood. But um, I think there is a slide on this, so I'll stop there. Okay, control of respiration. So I tell you your diaphragm, you tell your diaphragm to contract and take breath in. That's active processes inhalation. But are you constantly telling your diaphragm contract? Relax. Contract. Relax. You can, but really your brain does that for you. So your pons and your medulla oblongata, remember that, A and P1, he is going to help regulate respiration. Um, also, we have chemical sensors. And I told you, if you think carbon dioxide, you should think hydrogen. We have some chemoreceptors that are recognizing hydrogen. Also, we have some chemoreceptors recognizing oxygen. So they're scattered throughout the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And then of course we have other reflexes. So pleurisy, if it hurts to take a breath, you start to take a breath and you're like, ah, ow, you're gonna uh, stop taking a breath in. You're gonna stop that stretch. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the medulla oblongata. He is your vital reflex center. You remember that from AMP1, right? And your book lists the ventral and dorsal respiratory group. Don't memorize that. You need to know the medulla oblongata is the main rhythm generator of respiration. So, do you remember where it's sitting? It's kind of down to close to the top of your neck, right? So, if you're in a car accident or whatever kind of accident that snaps your neck up high, you're potentially going to squish your medulla oblongata and you die instantly because you can't breathe. Here's your vital reflex center. Heart rate, respiration rate, and blood pressure. Remember that? AP1. It just keeps coming back, doesn't it? Okay. So what makes you want to take a breath? Is it the fact that you need oxygen? No. What makes you take a breath is your body says, too much carbon dioxide, specifically hydrogen concentration. What is the pH of my blood? Remember, pH is the power of hydrogen. pH is measuring hydrogen concentration. The, the thing that is the huge player in your respiration is the concentration of carbon dioxide slash hydrogen ions. So some of the chemoreceptors are centrally, some of them are peripherally. So um, uh, we have them at the aortic arch and the carotid arteries, which we're gonna learn soon. Those guys are more sensing oxygen. But the big player of our respiration, routine basis, carbon dioxide, hydrogen concentration. I was going to skip this, but I see that phrenic nerve there. Um, so the phrenic nerve is a huge player in respiration. You do not want to cut that guy. Look where he's coming from. He's coming from the medulla oblongata area. He is a branch off of that dorsal respiratory group, I mean, ventral respiratory group. So the phrenic nerve, you have one on the left, one on the right. He goes to your diaphragm. Can you see how your, if you're gonna have neck surgery, your doctor is going to be very, very, very cautious of this nerve. Because what happens if you cut the phrenic nerve? You don't have innervation to your diaphragm. 
mention this in AMP1 if you had me. It's a big deal. It makes neck surgery scary enough that um, I'm not interested in doing it. So this is just showing the, um, the feedback loop, that negative feedback loop. If you get more CO2, you breathe faster um, because you want to blow it off, right? When everything is normal, your respiration is going to decrease. Well, what about altitude changes? Here's that here's that slide that I was wondering about. Okay, this one's opposite. Instead of diving down, this is like going up into the mountains. Um, what happens? when you have less oxygen right because if it's if it's less pressure you're going up in altitude you decrease your atmospheric pressure well that means that those air molecules are more spread out right because there's less pressure on them so they can dance about in a bigger space which means that every breath that you take in has less oxygen molecules because they're spread out well you're body is going to recognize that, hey, I've been up here for whatever, two hours, and I feel like I have less oxygen. Your brain is going to start increasing your respiratory rate. Your kidneys are going to start producing that hormone that I love, erythropoietin, more because you're going to need to make more red blood cells to catch as many oxygen molecules as possible. What is hyperventilation? I'm having a panic attack that um, four inch diameter spider just ran across my foot. <laughs> or I'm having an AMP2 test, I'm scared. Whatever makes you hyperventilate. When you hyperventilate, you are putting out carbon dioxide, putting out carbon dioxide, putting out carbon dioxide, and you're not getting good breaths in. So you're losing H pluses, losing H pluses, losing H pluses, and you're gonna pass out. If you're losing H pluses, you are losing, you're changing your pH, right? pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions. Out they go with every anxious pant. So you're going to make your blood more alkaline, more basic, and you're going to pass out because you have to have first week of AMP1, chapter one, we have an acid-base balance. So the purpose of that paper bag over your mouth when you're hyperventilating, you're rebreathing in that carbon dioxide. Because it becomes almost like a positive feedback thing where you start panting and panting and panting and panting and panting. And now you're low on carbon dioxide. So now you're starting to freak out. You aren't, but your brain is. So you pant, pant, pant more to try and get more and more oxygen. Well, if you're breathing into a paper bag, you're going to rebreathe in what you just exhaled and recapture that carbon dioxide and normalize. Whether you're racing in a triathlon or doing something less strenuous, you need to breathe in oxygen to help you get energy and breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product. When you inhale, your diaphragm and rib muscles contract, increasing the volume of your lungs. When you exhale, these muscles relax decreasing the volume of the lungs. When the lungs expand, air pressure in the lungs drops, causing air to flow into the lungs. When lung volume decreases, air pressure increases, causing air to flow out of the lungs. Air enters the nose or mouth, moves down the trachea, and goes into the two bronchi. Air moves down smaller and smaller bronchioles until it reaches a tiny sac, an alveolus. Each alveolus is surrounded by capillaries.
oxygen diffuses from the alveolus to the blood, and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood to the alveolus. As blood flows through the capillary, it becomes rich in oxygen. In the blood, oxygen diffuses into a red blood cell and binds to hemoglobin, a protein made up of four subunits. One oxygen molecule can bind to each subunit. Oxygen-rich blood flows from the lungs to the heart. which pumps this blood to capillaries all over the body. Here, we see oxygen diffusing from a capillary's red blood cells into a muscle cell. Oxygen is used by the cell's mitochondria to produce ATP during cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is released. How does carbon dioxide leave the body? Carbon dioxide diffuses from cells into capillaries. Some carbon dioxide stays in the plasma, the liquid part of the blood. Most carbon dioxide, however, enters red blood cells. Some carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin. The rest is converted to bicarbonate, which diffuses into the plasma. This oxygen-poor blood flows back to the heart. which pumps it to the lungs. There, carbon dioxide diffuses from the plasma into the alveolus. Bicarbonate enters red blood cells and is converted back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also released from hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the red blood cells into the plasma and into the alveolus. When you exhale, air flows out of your lungs. And that's how you release carbon dioxide, get oxygen, and keep on running. So you should definitely have this memorized by now. I'm not even going to tell you on this what it is. You're going to look it up if you don't know. What is emphysema? So emphysema is where you have these pockets of air in your lungs. The, the alveoli have popped. Um, there's not a whole bunch of tiny little air spaces anymore. There's one giant air space. Bronchitis, itis, inflammation of the bronchi. Both of these guys decrease the ability to get air out because if you have a giant uh, pocket, now instead of tiny little, little, tiny little sacs, you have a great big sac, you're going to have dead space. So it's going to be hard to exchange that gas, get it out of that giant sac. And when I say giant, those sacs could be an inch, two inches, three inches, whatever chronic bronchitis, you're having a hard time getting the air back out of the airway. Um, you can force it in, right? but you can't get it back out. So smoking, bad, if you don't know that yet. The term dyspnea is a memorization term. Dyspnea is labored breathing. Um, most of these guys are just really having a hard time getting rid of carbon dioxide, right? Because they can't force the air out so that carbon dioxide is building up. You're still having the blood flow bringing oxygen to your cells and your cells are still making carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide wants out, but it's hung up in the lower respiratory tree. If you can't get rid of that carbon dioxide, you're going to have a hard time getting that oxygen in and you're going to become hypoxic. 
A person with emphysema often has a very specific look, kind of a barrel chest. So I'm telling you that you have obstructive airway disease, and then you've got this trapped air that can't get out because of, you know, pathology in your lungs. Well, that trapped air causes hyperinflation. And remember, when you took a breath in, your diaphragm went flat, your ribs went out and kind of up, and then you kind of stay in that, uh, with chronicity, you stay with that um, appearance, that barrel chest. Um, you start using accessory muscles, so you're just going to start to use those internal uh, intercostal muscles. And then also your um, capillaries in that area are going to get damaged which can actually end up affecting your heart. Remember, respiratory system and circulatory system are closely linked. Bronchitis, you've got these obstructive airways. They're full of snot. and Maybe the, the, um, there's edema in the mucous membranes. Um, with the lower tree, so as you go further down, um, inflammation can lead to scarring, so fibrosing is scarring. I mentioned that with um, cirrhosis of the liver. Um, when you can't get all that excess mucus out, you are more prone to bacteria love moisture, and it gives them a little petri dish to, to live in. So what can cause that, you know, allergic responses can cause that, but Smoking is a biggie. When you have asthma, your chest feels tight. And what's happening is the smooth muscle in the bronchi are responding to something. So whether it's a pollen or if it's exercise induced, your smooth muscle are, con are contracting, which squeezes your um, bronchi. So when it squeezes the bronchi, you can't get as much air in. Over time, if you are getting infections with this and such, um, this could be a problem for permanency. But most of the time, asthma responds great to medicine. Just be sure and take the medicine. Tuberculosis is a bacteria. It's a mean bacteria. He's got this crazy wall around him that makes it hard for um, antibiotics to get through. There's different kinds of mycobacterium, but the specific one that causes tuberculosis is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, it loves to get into the lungs and you'll start coughing up blood, get a fever. And because of that wall around that bacteria, he needs a long-term amount of antibiotics. This is when your doctor tells you to take antibiotics for a certain amount of time, you need to finish it out because there's a reason that the medical field has determined, I need to take these antibiotics for five days, 14 days, three months. We don't want to just knock that bacteria back. We want to kill it. If it's hard to kill, but it does respond to the medicine, you might need to take it for a longer period of time. Now, another problem with mycobacterium tuberculosis is that some of them become drug resistant, so that's not good. Uh, a person can become a carrier, and your body is actually going to make these little walls around the bacteria called tubercles, and that's how it got, got its name. Um, that person might not know that they have big problem until it just gets to the point that they uh, have hardly any space left in the chest when they're carriers. Stop smoking. Stop smoking. Stop smoking. Leading cause of cancer deaths in North America. Adenocarcinoma. Adeno means uh, glandular tissue. So it's going to happen from the bronchial glands mostly squamous cell carcinoma so bronchial epithelium and small cell carcinoma that's going to be more from lymphocyte like cells there none of them are good you don't want any of these guys stop smoking
sleep apnea. What's happening with that? Well, it's usually obstructive. So the your throat is going to start to relax, right, when you're sleeping. And what will end up happening is it kind of, you'll have maybe some sort of tissue that is collapsing into the area, sagging, causing an obstruction. So a CPAP machine is actually constantly pushing the airway open, open keeping it from uh, collapsing. Uh, and CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure, so continuously pushing air. Um, what is apnea? So dyspnea is difficulty in breathing, apnea, A, without, and then there's that P-N-E-A, without breathing. So it's temporary sensation where somebody takes a breath in and then it's like nothing happens for several, several, several seconds. And if you sleep with somebody with sleep apnea, then you, you usually know that they have it. First, they snore because as they <laughs> trying to bring the um, air past the um, tissue that's kind of sagging, it makes a snore. Um, and then you'll notice that that person is just like stuck and nothing happens for a while. So <clears throat> a CPAP machine is pushing air in.